Excuse me, guys. All right, what's up, class? This is Optimus Fields at My Living Truth, and we're back for another episode. We're at block height 662721 and the current price is $23,150. Take it away, Nick. Yo, what's up, everyone? It's Nick here, and before we get started with our presentation, we're going to have a quick word from our sponsor. Citadel 21 is a Bitcoin cultural zine that displays the best of the best content directly by the plebs for the plebs. You can read all their articles online for free or even purchase uh, physical copies of all your favorite volumes. I got all four of the physical volumes that are out currently and they're really freaking sweet and it's like a nice collector item to have. So I highly recommend you go get some. Also, if you want to write for them and you're eager to write something, I highly recommend you do it. Anyone and anyone and everyone can submit articles. So if you're if you're eager to write something, check out their website at Citadel 21 and go submit some work and also read their papers. But for tonight, BTC Baker is joining us and he has a really good presentation on Bitcoin and institutions that I am looking forward to a lot. And I know Optimist is as well. Um, there's been a lot of institutional uh, institutions coming into Bitcoin this year and uh, BTC Baker is here to talk about it. So BTC Baker, thanks for coming on. Yeah, no problem, guys. Uh, looking forward to giving a little bit of insight from the brokerage side and, you know, how people are moving into Bitcoin, not not just retail, but also the institutions mainly. Um, so, I mean, if y'all have any questions or anything along the way, don't hesitate to stop me. Um, a little bit about me, I am working at one of uh, the, the bigger, I guess, guess bigger at this point at uh, tech startups in the brokerage space um so hopefully i can uh you know i i can push the the mark for bitcoin here soon and we can move forward uh but to start the presentation first we're going to talk about institutional interest and the uh fincen rule on the self-hosted wallets that's just coming out over the past couple of days, um, some regulatory advances, the premiums on GBTC, uh, custodial questions, and then the Michael Saylor, uh, are you a Bitcoin ETF question? So um, first to get started on these self-hosted wallets. So this is a big thing because now the brokerages are going to be able to... Um, you know, they can actually sell physical Bitcoin now. If you look at it from the perspective of, you know, we're losing our privacy, yes, we do. We do lose in that end. But whenever you have a self-hosted wallet that is kind of whitelisted and the exchange knows exactly who you are, you can, you know it's not going to be a big deal for the brokerage to then sell Bitcoin. So these regulatory advances, yes, it is, it's not fun for us, but it's a way for everybody else to get in on the game. Um, and that's also why you see the premium on uh, GBTC. So Grayscale Bitcoin is going to have a lot of that premium because it takes care of the regulatory advances already and it is that you know this is the government approved product that everybody can go ahead and buy uh, let's see next custody and family offices so a lot of the institutions right now their question isn't you know how what is Bitcoin? You know, it's not some new thing on the block. It's been out for over 10 years now. So people aren't really asking what it is. It's more, how do we get it? So a, a lot of the regulation that's coming forward, it'll allow the family offices to move on into the space. Um, I, I see all this as a good thing. I see, you know, even though it is FUD to a lot of people, I think all this 
is good for the NGU technology. Um, I mean, at, at this point, it's not an if, but when the family offices and all, all the other institutions decide to pile in. So um, I, I think that's going to be a fun thing to watch. And then um, and another thing I wanted to talk about. So the Michael Saylor Bitcoin ETF question on uh, Squawk Box, or it might have been CNBC Squawk Box. I don't remember which. Um, but it is interesting that you have this Bitcoin vehicle where institutions are now able to go and buy a stock instead of having to buy, you know, say a property or another commodity like Bitcoin. They're able to buy a stock and get this exposure like an ETF. Now, this is really important because people can buy into the Bitcoin exposure while also getting the cash flow generation that uh, MicroStrategy is going to provide. So, yes, they are the business intelligence analytics firm, but they're also going to be providing that exposure to Bitcoin. So it's kind of a, a two for one in, in that sense. Um, but moving on to the next one, let's see. <laughs> Um, so I had a couple people asking me, how did uh, MicroStrategy execute their $500 million purchase? Um, essentially, they broke it up into many uh, small pieces. You'll see here, uh, the Coinbase team actually responded on this one. Uh, but they said, our system takes a large order and breaks it into many small pieces that are executed across multiple trading venues. So a lot of people aren't even really going to notice whenever these institutions start coming in. They'll just say, you know, hey, why is why is the Bitcoin leaving our wallets? You know, OK, there's more people coming in and buying. You can't just identify that it's some institution or some specific entity coming and purchasing that Bitcoin. So, um, I mean, as as Coinbase kind of expands and as they IPO, I think we do see a lot more companies approach Coinbase and say, hey, we want to purchase Bitcoin, but we don't know how. Um, and then you'll see the Coinbase Pro um, Bitcoin reserves decline even further. Let's see on my next slide. So one of the main things I was going to talk about today uh, was the MicroStrategy debt offering. Um, they were offering a, uh, let's see, it looks like 75 BIPs convertible senior notes due in 2025. So these notes are unsecured senior obligations of MicroStrategy, bear interest at a rate of 0.75 per annum, paying, uh, or sorry, payable semi-annually. So for a lot of people who don't, you know, they don't deal in bonds, they don't work in these debt instruments. What this is, this is MicroStrategy essentially issuing their own, like think of it as MicroStrategy issuing their own coin and selling that coin and converting it into Bitcoin. So right now MicroStrategy is going out, they're saying, hey, we want to sell a lot of our debt have people buy it up and you know the assumption as a buyer of these bonds is that you're going to make payments that aren't going to outpace MicroStrategy's stock run the the trick here is that it's a convertible senior note so the senior part meaning it has um, seniority over other obligations or notes um, and then let's see on the 0.75 so these bonds are going to be paying 0.75 biannually so that's going to be 75 per bond that you buy typically it's a thousand dollar face value so you're going to get 75 dollars per annum and you divide that by two that's 32 and a half so a bond holder is going to be getting, you know, thirty-two and a half dollars 
every six months for purchasing this MicroStrategy bond. Now, I would not say that's worth it in the slightest, because you could obviously just put that into Bitcoin, but there are more people willing to go and fund a business's venture, so they're willing to go and purchase MicroStrategy debt, because it's really cheap to go and borrow money and go purchase that debt too. Um, to go a little bit further though, let's see. So the conversion rate for these notes is initial, initially two and a half shares approximately. So for every 1000 face value bond, you'll get two and a half shares of micro strategy. Um, once it reaches the price of 39, or 398 once it reaches that price that's when MicroStrategy is going to be able to start calling those bonds so um, the the crazy thing is MicroStrategy could do this for Did we lose him? I think so. Once yeah. to game oh. the system, he's already hey, you know, he's hey, already Baker. on step Baker. one. Step two is gonna be Hey Baker, we lost you a couple times. I'm early if his stock price runs up. So you think about it. He's making the ultimate play because right now he can go cash out of thin air and at the same time go buy Bitcoin, which is then going to run up. And then as he does that, that makes his balance sheet looks, look better, which he can then use Bitcoin on his assets sheet and he can use that as collateral to go and get more money and go take out more loans and go in issue more debt so essentially micro strategy could get in this infinite loop of purchasing bitcoin and issuing debt um but let's let's move on to the next one um let's see so uh, i did say this was just a drop in an ocean so micro strategy estimates that the net proceeds from the sale of the notes will be approximately 635 million after deducting uh, the initial purchasers discounts and commissions so they do intend to invest all of the net proceeds into bitcoin so this this is going to start to become the norm and as we see firms get tired of holding melting ice cubes um that's that's kind of whenever you see these uh slowly then suddenly you know, or the gradually, then suddenly, it's a lot of people start transferring from, you know, holding cash to Bitcoin, 1% Bitcoin, or holding 50% Bitcoin. It's no longer a question of, you know, should we do it? It's what if we don't? Because it's, it's so risky at this point not to hold Bitcoin. And, and to go further... Uh, so, um, this was kind of just a piece I wanted to put in here about, uh, Bitcoin. So this really is just about building financial independence. A lot of what Bitcoin is, is just hard money. It's savings technology. Everybody should be stacking sats in every opportunity you get. Um, every time I buy Bitcoin, it's, it's the most confident purchase I make every single day. And I know... 10 years from now, every dollar I'm going to be putting in is going to be worth more than it is now. Um, and beyond that, budgeting and proper allocation. So um, I'll, I'll tell a quick story real quick. Um, I had actually worked with one of the UBS Ultra Net Worth advisors here in, in Texas, and he was talking to me about budgeting and allocating funds and it doesn't really matter how much money you make nominally it's more about 
how you allocate your funds in a percentage wise. Um, this guy had three billion under management, and he said some of the best advice I, I think I'd ever heard. And um, you know, he's saying as a financial advisor, he has the easiest job in the world. All you have to do is tell people how to allocate their money and how to not spend it. And the best advice I can give to everybody, you know, you save 75% of your funds, you allocate towards expenses, 20% towards investment and savings, and 5% towards charity. And at that point, everybody can retire. It's not, it's not a, a difficult thing whenever you set aside 20% every time you get paid. But, I mean, putting more and putting it into Bitcoin, that obviously expedites that process. So, um, any funds that you can allocate to Bitcoin, and it, it'll definitely yield better returns than anything else at this point. So, I think that's, uh, that's all I got, boys. Awesome. Uh, I had a quick question, is... Going back to the MicroStrategy debt offering, whoever took the other side of the trade mm -hmm. and offered, you know, Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy in the notes, what do you think they're thinking? Like, what is their game plan and their strategy? I mean, at that point, what... I, I would say you have to ask the same question to anybody who's going to buy a bond, right? Yeah. So if you, if you go in the brokerage market and you're looking to buy a bond, you're just looking for the highest yield. A lot of the time, the highest yield and the best rating. So you want, you know, triple A that's offering the best or highest rate. Um now, I, I didn't look into the uh, specifics on what rating MicroStrategy had, but, I mean, 0.75 interest rate, that's not bad across the market. Okay. Does, um, have... does anyone else have any questions, Jim? I do, yeah. Um, do you know, two questions, and the second one is hinged on the first. Uh, do you mm -hmm. know if MicroStrategy had any other outstanding bonds issued? before this uh, recent um, deal uh, put out. I don't, I don't think they had any outstanding bonds. I do know they actually repurchased shares over the past yes, few I, years. I, they did that as a tender offer before they bought the Bitcoin. So this way, any stockholders that didn't like that risk could get out and they paid a premium. Well, yeah, yeah. Stock back. On, um, on top of that, I was saying, I'm pretty sure they had been purchasing or buying back shares in the previous years. Yeah, it wouldn't. It, I had Michael Sale has not mentioned one thing about having any debt on the company. They had all that cash sitting around, probably because they weren't carrying any debt, so there probably wasn't any other bonds. I'm curious. Would you know? Um, <clears throat> uh, it seems to me that if they did have other bondholders, because bondholders always have a primary claim. Uh, over stockholders in a liquidation of a company, mm -hmm. would uh, would a previous bond issue become worth less, uh, or theoretically get downgraded because this is this new issue would take precedence over it? And when the people bought the first bond, it didn't exist, and it's almost like somebody cut the line ahead of them. You know what I mean? Like a, yeah. a higher level debtor would come in, and that would it would devalue the the earlier issuance of bond, if it was there, is that a, an accurate way well, to look at it? Because uh, so, as you were saying it, I was wondering to myself, what about all the existing bondholders? But maybe there aren't any. So, yeah, so I'm just the, curious. Each series of loans or each term of loan will have a different rating, right? So, you know, say the the 2025 notes will be AAA, and then the 2030 notes are double B. It, it, it'll be different varying on the term okay but that doesn't address my my specific point if some bonds were issued before and there was no other bonds you bought some micro strategy bond way before bitcoin or any of this and you thought oh, they're mm -hmm. a big company i don't mind owning some of their debt you mm -hmm. bought that at a, at a certain risk rate that you you look at a company you look at their 
you know, what's their ability to pay back this bond and my interest payments. And you say, okay, I'm taking X amount of risk. And then they take, make all these changes to their company and Bitcoin comes along and they, and, you know, and you think, okay, I, I own part of this company. They owe me money. And now they just o offered another round of, of, uh, you know, they're going to borrow more money through bonds and those bondholders have a senior claim on the company over me. And I was here before them. So in theory, the bond I hold now just becomes worth because they just issued a bond that has a, a senior claim over the assets of the company over the one I currently hold. So I would think so, that my bond in, on the market would trade for less money. I would have to, I would have to give up. I would have to sell it for less and, and give a higher yield to the guy buying it from me because it's more risky now in terms of not getting my interest or getting paid back on my principal, but the fact that I'm a less senior creditor on a company that could fail, maybe. Right. I, I get your point. So from a seniority standpoint, a company would not be able to, well, yes, they would be able to issue, you know, however much money as long as their board is willing to do so. Now, on the senior part, you're not going to lose value because they choose to issue a new series of bonds. It's You're still going to maintain that same seniority, whether, you know, the bonds that you had from years ago, those could be senior notes too, right? Well, that's just it. So. What, what are... They weren't. Uh, it just can't even be done. Maybe there's no legal ability for a company to, you know, offer debt to new investors that, that have a superior claim over older investors. Like I said earlier, like cutting the line, so to speak. Um, it would like maybe there's a, a a spot in the in the rules that allow you know public companies to do things like that. But it was just a thought that I had in mind as you were describing. You know, them issuing this, and you called it a senior debt. And I heard him explain it the same way. I've never looked into it, but I figured I'd ask you while we were here. And if you knew specifically if they had other bonds, and then um, uh, more so, if they did, would it do the things I was trying to describe and that I envisioned? You know, make the first set of bonds worth less, and could they even do it legally? You know, what, what would you? Yeah, if you're I mean, a current bondholder, wouldn't you get like, hey, what the hell are you guys doing here? You just downgraded my bonds because you issued more above me I, yeah that's the, the logic i see but maybe they can't even do it i have no idea it's just not part of my wheelhouse too much i mean so i mean they can they can issue bonds whenever their board approves of it now the value of that you know so they'll they'll issue it at say okay they're 0.75 that's the percentage that they're issuing it at but afterwards, you know, once it's trading on the market, it can vary in the, you know, in the face value and then in what the yield is. And then on top of that, it's not MicroStrategy issuing the rating. It's Moody's and uh, I think it's a Bloomberg index. Um, but they're going to be issuing the ratings on the different series of bonds. So are you saying that a bond cannot be issued with more privileges, so to speak? I, well, when I when I hear when I hear the phrase "senior offering," I think of something that has more features or is when, whenever more valuable right away. So the the senior that all that means is whenever it comes down to it, whenever they're liquidating everything, it is one of the first things that you know they have one of the first top claims that, but that's always the case for bondholders and now the right, question is right in my so mind there's... is there different levels of bondholders which there might be i don't know yeah so there are the secured bondholders and then the unsecured bond oh uh, yeah that's right i, I remember hearing that one so yeah, again you know so if you had is... two Two Go series ahead. of bonds that were both secured or whatever. Does one take precedence over another? If the first one was issued with a certain amount of, you know, uh, corporate income and capital, therefore a certain risk characteristic, and then years later they issue another one under different parameters. I just feel like there's got to be some, like, I wonder if, say, the board would have to get 
not permission, but somehow notify existing bondholders, hey, we're going to issue something that has a higher claim above our company for towards our company above you guys. And but before we do it, we're going to give you like an offer. We'll pay, we'll pay you out now, almost like he did with the tender offer on the stock when before they bought Bitcoin, they felt that they had to tell those people that own stock that if they didn't like that idea and, that, you know, they, they could get out and get a premium on their stock and some people cashed out which they were stupid because Michael's strategy stock doubled. So <laughs> those people were dumb, but we know there's a lot of them out there still because they don't get Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, mm -hmm. this is a little bit different. This is a, t a standard bond issue for U.S. dollars. Michael Saylor is just taking the dollars and buying Bitcoin with it. The bondholders that are buying it are just investing in bonds of a company they think is going to pay them back. And maybe, you know, taking on a little more risk, but at least getting more return than, say, you know, negative percent treasury rate or something you know so yeah. like, there are people that still think that you you know that one of the smart things you should do is own some bonds in your portfolio that's why they're out there people l love bonds they they pay steady returns you know whatever so the idea that people aren't going to want to buy bonds of companies that's probably not going to go away anytime soon even though we all think bitcoin's a way better place to stick your money why why put it in a bond get 75 bucks on your thousand you know every yeah. year when you could double Double it, triple it, quadruple it, just that profile thing and whatever. And not everybody understands Bitcoin yet. Exactly. Anyway, stuff to ponder. Thank you for your time with all this and your explanation. I'm still curious about the bond thing. Maybe somebody else will, uh, will know yeah, a little I mean, more about the details. There. I'm not I'm not an expert on the on the bond market. I mean, I'm more on the brokerage side. So I actually uh, did have a uh, talk with... Uh, our crypto ops manager the other day um but i can't really can't really disclose much of that unfortunately no worries uh baker I, I got a question it might be a tad bit speculative on your end but mm -hmm. uh to the people that you've encountered uh, what is their view on Bitcoin? Are they just looking at it as an inflation hedge or are they going full Michael Saylor Bitcoin standard? Uh, it's not it's not the Michael Saylor Bitcoin standard. Everybody, in, right now it's the inflation hedge if they even understand what it is. A lot of people, I mean, even my peers, as a broker, a lot of my peers still have no idea um about any of the basics of bitcoin really so you know i've i've fielded hundreds of calls on people in the industry just trying to buy bitcoin and you know at, at brokerage firms you don't really have it yet so gbtc is your closest right um but i mean a lot of people are just looking for that speculative hedge unfortunately but I mean, they'll they'll be the lucky ones to to ride the wave too, right? Yeah, number go up will will cure all all ills. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, do we have any more questions? If if not, uh, we'll wrap this one up and and we'll jump into teaching lunch. One question here. I don't know if it's uh, general, and I guess like. It's different uh, from case to case, but let's say that many institutions are buying in Bitcoin and then we see some doomsday scenarios or major FUD and they decide to dump it on the market. How fast do you think can they do that? Can it be like a flash crash scenario when they can access Bitcoin and just drop it on the market? Or they have some systems in place that are not allowing uh, fast, you know, dumping of Bitcoin? Well, I mean, there's no there's no circuit breaker on Bitcoin, right? Like in yeah. the NYSE, in the Nasdaq, you have market halts, you have circuit breakers, or uh, you know, uh, Vitalik saying stop the trading because Ethereum doesn't work or something like that. You know, there is nobody who can really shut it off. But at the same time, you sit there and ask i mean even if they did dump a whole bunch of bitcoin i don't think we would see some sort of flash crash i think we are maturing into the market where there's kind of a price floor now so say say the price dumps down to you know 15k is micro strategy going to be a buyer or a seller 
I'd say they're a buyer because they want to buy more and get a lower cost basis. I, you know, there are some people who would say they'll sell because it's going down, but at the same time, as these institutions flood in, there are more people who are going to be buying up that 900 Bitcoin daily supply. So I, I just don't see... I mean, obviously, there can be a flash crash at any point in any asset or, or market, but we are maturing to the point where there will be $1,000 moves in a day. That shouldn't surprise anyone, but it, it's not going to be just institutions dumping all their Bitcoin at once. Yeah, I, I, I see. Yes, I, I understand that. I'm just curious if, like... Um, the institutions they have any kind of procedure in place and they have to get whatever signatures and permissions from you know five different board members or is just literally one person can decide and just you know send a bunch of bitcoin on exchange from hard wallet whatever and then it just you know yeah it's just that, that that part will vary by the structuring and like the the legal structure of each different firm so you know, if one company says you have to get 10 board members to sign off on it, another company could just be two people and you only have to have one person sign the transaction. It's, All right. That yeah. one can okay. vary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yep. I got a you question. Know? Go ahead. Do you tell the people that you work with to have fun? Dang. <laughs> Yeah, I actually have. I've, <laughs> I've already told them that. Um, <laughs> I actually had one of my colleagues ask me about his... He was like, so um, should I sell my Ripple? He asked me that two days ago, and I was like, man, yes. <laughs> I told him yes, and I hope he did. But He better I mean, hope he did. <laughs> yeah, I... Man, it's it's crazy the lack of knowledge that we have, even in the industry. We're still so early. Preach. Preach. That's why we got to teach everyone the ways. Well, we, we do our best over here to try to educate our pre-coiners. So this is that's why we do the show. But uh, beautiful, guys. Yeah, what's up? What was that? I said, talk to me as if I was a kindergartner. Uh, hey, 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 little boy. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Nick. Wait, hold up. <laughs> You're gonna uh, hear police sirens in the back of. We uh, got them. All right, Optimus. all right, all right. Let's let's uh, <laughs> let's not do this now. We'll do this in teachers' lounge. Okay. All right, all right, Baker. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for coming out. Uh, we'll keep this thanks, one. Baker. Yeah, short and sweet. Uh, hey, if you want to show your Twitter or or whatever you want to show, let let the people know, and then uh, we'll we'll end this recording. Oh yeah, uh, follow me on Twitter right there. Put it for the people, Adam Bake BTC. Appreciate you guys listening, and uh, if y'all have any other questions, just give me a shout. DMs are open. Oh, and th yeah, thank you guys for having me. No worries, dude. Thanks for reaching out. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming on. All right. And so, that, Optimus, do you want to take us out? Yeah. Uh, that was, I believe, episode 49. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. Stick around for Teacher's Lounge, and we'll chat all things Bitcoins. See you next week, guys. Peace.